Grab your Bible, remain standing, Luke 23 and 33. Happy Father's Day, brothers. I said, Happy Father's Day, brother. Come on. Can we thank God real quick? I know we did it, but y'all, thank God for the brothers, the men in the house. Happy Father's Day. Man, I'm so glad to see y'all. And y'all doing a little better, treating the men a little better. Y'all, we working with y'all. Y'all gonna get there. Y'all gonna get there. Luke 23, 33. Gerald, I know what you mean about family coming in. The, the baby in the family came in from California. My youngest, my 18-year-old, and JC, she came in. She's, she's the ballerina. And I'm not talking about trying to be a ballerina. She dances for San Francisco Ballet. And so you hear, you know, you just, just trust me when I tell you. You know, like, names like Misty Copeland and, you know, Shannon Harkins and Makala the Prince. Just keep listening for J.C. Gallia. It's only a matter of time. Just keep listening. Amen. Amen. It's Father's Day. I can be a proud father. Amen. Amen. Luke 23 and 33, if you have it, say amen. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Amen. You can have your seat. I, I know that's the strangest Father's Day text in creation. I want to just preach lessons from a model man. Y'all, I need y'all to hang with me for just a couple minutes. I, I think we have historically misrepresented and mischaracterized Jesus. Not only have we mischaracterized him racially and ethnically, and I don't have time to deal with that in this sermon. We've misrepresented when we have imagined him as a blue-eyed, hippie-looking, effeminate man, ignoring the reality that the early Christian church fathers were African, Tertullian and Augustine and Athanasius and Cyprian and Oregon, all from North Africa. They were not necessarily dark skinned, but they certainly weren't white. I got to wondering how would our society be different if the body that hung on the cross bloody was portrayed properly as a brown body? How would our society look different if we saw him as the Middle Eastern Jew with hair like wool and feet like bronze? I'm going somewhere because I think sometimes men don't want to follow Jesus because we've made him into some weak, feminine, long-haired hippie. When in reality, Jesus was strong. If, matter of fact, if anybody was a man's man, it was Jesus. Jesus spent his life as a carpenter, working with stones and wood. Jesus was a great orator. Every time he opened up his mouth, people would listen to what he said. Jesus was a natural born leader that people were naturally gravitated towards him. And, and what I want to do today is I want to re re-represent Jesus. And I want to argue for a moment that as he hangs upon the cross, he gives us, you remember those seven last words that he spoke? When he speaks those seven last words, he's really given us seven lessons of what manhood ought look like. 
and I don't know about you, but I'm grateful for the men in my life. Y'all missed a good place to clap and say amen. I, let me try it another way. Is there anybody in church grateful for the lessons of some of the men that have been in your life? Anybody here grateful for the people that God put in your life? Thank God for mamas, but this ain't mama's day. This is daddy's day, and we ought to be grateful for the men, the men that have instructed us, the men that have prayed for us, the men that have provided a model, a men that have provided a road map on how we ought to live. And the reason I'm highlighting Jesus today is because there's only two models of manhood. I said there's only two models of manhood. Model one, the first Adam, of whom sin is introduced into the world, who takes no responsibility for the sin, but puts the blame on the woman. And then there's the second model of manhood, who is the second Adam, who is Jesus, who literally does not sin at all, but takes upon himself the sins of all humanity so that all of us can be saved. And I want every man to hear me. There is not a third model of manhood. I'm either a model after the first Adam or I'm a man after the second Adam. I'm either a man that creates problems or I'm a man that fixes problems. I'm either a man that causes issues or I'm a man that resolves issues. There, tell your neighbor, there's not a third man. And what I want to argue as I preach today is that we need to embody and emulate the first Adam, second Adam, who is Jesus. You know, you can tell a man by how he handles issues and difficulties and hardships. Jesus is taken to Golgotha, a skull, a hill, and the first thing out of his mouth at the worst moment of his life, don't get mad, ladies, but while he is hanging, the first thing out of his mouth is not mother. The first thing out of his mouth is father. Don't you tell me men don't matter. Don't you dare try. I might as well go ahead and preach here. We live in a society and if you pay careful attention, a society that deliberately, intentionally, willfully emasculates men and make them seem unnecessary. I, I, was, I was looking at this BP commercial the other day. It's a Hispanic family, appears to be a Hispanic family. They driving a pickup truck. The woman driving, that's fine. The man is in the passenger seat. The kids are in the back. They nervous about whether or not they have enough gas to make the trip. The wife says, I gassed up the truck. She driving the truck, gassed up the truck, and got all the answers for the family. And the man is just sitting on the sideline as if he's just a bystander that doesn't know what's going on. Y'all don't like preaching like this on Father's Day. And subconsciously and subliminally, the message is the woman got it. But I wish I had a handful of people that recognize that the way God has orchestrated this thing and ordained this thing is so that when Jesus is about to die on a cross, thank God for Mary, but he ain't calling on Mary. He calling on Father. And I think he teaches us the first important lesson. And the first important lesson we learn from this model man is that we have to learn to talk to God. Somebody say talk to God. 
Y'all, when we get to the worst moment in our life, y'all, prayer still works. I wish I had a church that understood prayer still works. When I don't have no power, I still have prayer. When I don't have answers, I still have prayer. When things don't look like it's going well for me, I still have prayer. Is there anybody with a testimony on Father's Day when I couldn't do nothing else? I knew how to throw my head back and say, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know. Anybody here? with a testimony that God will answer prayer. That, tell your neighbor, talk to God. I, I think too many times in our life we don't recognize that I got to learn to talk to God. And it's all right to be men who pray. I don't know where my praying men are, but I'm grateful for men that know I'm not less a man when I pray. But the reality of it is I'm proving my manhood when I pray because I recognize I don't have all the answers, but at least I serve a God in glory. And I want to go ahead and bless somebody. Even if you don't have a good relationship with your earthly father, you still have a heavenly father. You still have a father in heaven that I can say, God, I'm struggling, but I need intercession and intervention right now. Jesus, out of the first thing he says is, let me tell you something, talk to God. Brothers, listen to me, talk to God. Sister, stop wanting men who want to talk to you, but not to God. Can I get your number? Do you have his? Can we talk? Have y'all? Because can I bring y'all in a little closer? Y'all might not want to talk had y'all already talked. Because had y'all already talked, God might have said, I don't want you talking to that joker down. Talk to God. Yo, you, you. Can I kill a demon? Because I see it trying to get out the door real quick. Let me get it in the spirit realm. Don't misrepresent the book of Genesis. When it talks about man ought not be alone. It's not good for man to be alone. That's not a generic statement for all men and all people. That text literally says this kind of man is not good to be alone. What kind of man? The one talking to God? The one with a job? The one with a house? I don't have help in here. He had a garden, that means he had a place to live. He had a job, he was supposed to tend and keep the garden. He daily walked with the Lord day in and day out. And God looked at him and said, boy, you got money, you got possessions, you got a relationship with me, it ain't good for you to be alone. But if you broke and ain't got nowhere to live and ain't got no job and you ain't got no skills, you need to be alone. I got three criteria before I perform a wedding. Counseling, salvation, and a full-time job for him. I don't have help. I see, I would have moved on had, had I got a few, two or three more amens. But if you can't take care of just you, you can't take care of you and them, or you and her, and you and the fam. They, they look like they need to be educated, Ryan. Let me help you for a moment. One baby adds $7 per hour to your cost of living. Which means if you buy yourself and you make $15 an hour, you barely making it. That's right at about just above the poverty line. If you have one baby and you make $15 an hour, it automatically requires you to now make at least $22 an hour to stay out of poverty. Um, let me move on. Talk to God. It's the first lesson from the model man. As he's dying on the cross, Jesus looks over at a thief on the cross and he says, today, you will be with me 
in paradise. It's the second statement and the second lesson from our model man. Second lesson for the model man, Judge, is he's teaching us to treat people in a way that gives them life. <laughs> y'all, y'all, just because I'm going through public pain does not mean I have license to treat you any way and do anything I want to do to you. I think a lot of times people think because they're going through a crisis and a hardship, that don't give me license to be nasty with you. That does not give me license to ignore what you have going on in your life. And while Jesus himself is hanging on the cross, a thief on either side of him and looks at one of them and says, I want to say something to you that's going to give you life. Can I park here for a moment and encourage every man and every woman that's in church on Father's Day that when I open up my mouth, I need to open up my mouth in a way that's going to give people life that's going to encourage people that's going to help people understand there is still hope take take 15 seconds real quick look over at one person and just tell them something life-giving tell them tell them you look good tell them you got potential tell them god is for you get on east city campus type in something that gives people life and can i tell you why sometimes we don't the struggle, I got to watch. Tell your neighbor, watch who you hanging with. Some of y'all catch that in the spirit next week. I said, you got to watch who you're hanging with. You don't need to hang with people that's always negative and always cynical and always critical. I need to hang with some people that can speak power to me, that can speak life to me, that can speak strength to me, that can speak victory to me. I need to hang with some folk that can lift me up when I'm struggling. I don't need folk that's going to speak curses. I need folk that's going to speak blessing in my life. This thief he spoke to, he gets saved moments before he dies. I don't know who I'm talking to. In a moment, you're going to have an opportunity to get saved. You're going to have an opportunity to join the church. And God don't care what you've done up until this point. He don't care how many years I feel the Holy Ghost. He doesn't care how many years you have spent struggling, how many years you spent in lack, how many years you spent in sin. I'm about to give you a blessing. God is able to restore all the years that have been wasted. He said, do I have any witnesses in the room that God is able to restore? Yeah, I got it wrong for 20 years. God can do more in six months than you couldn't do in 20 years if you surrender your life to him this man spent his whole life hanging with the wrong people people that encouraged him to to, to embrace criminal activity people that 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 encouraged him to be less than what he was going to be and he finally hangs with the right somebody y'all missed it i said he hung with the right somebody. And it don't mean it don't matter how many years I hung with the wrong somebody. The moment I get to hang with Jesus, at that moment, he will pick you up and turn your life around and set you in a better place. He says, he says to him, he says, look, 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 today, because I gotta start treating people in a way that gives them life. We not we ought not be talking to our kids about you stupid. You make me sick. Get out of my face. You just like your mama. You remind me of your daddy. No, I need to be looking at them, speaking their potential, treating them in a way that gives them life. And can I go ahead and kill the demon? And I ought not be living vicariously through them. That's why you got to learn to train up a child, not in any old way, but in the way that God has or naturally ordained them to go. Every child is not going to graduate college. Every child is not. Some are going to own businesses. Some I got to train. I got to see their giftedness and their skill. And I got to be willing to pour into that. They don't need to be a doctor because you are. They don't need to be an accountant because you are. They don't need to be a teacher because you are. We need to train them up in how they are naturally gifted. 
So I got to treat people with in a way that gives them life. I need to learn how to talk to God. There's a third lesson. I got to go quick, y'all. He then looks over in John 19 at, at his mama while he's dying. And he says, woman, behold that son. And son, behold that mother. I want to part. I may not, I don't know how far I'm going to get all these today, but this is so dear to my heart. I want y'all to grab this. The, the, the third lesson from this model man is I have to learn to tend to the needs of my family. Yeah. Tell somebody your family matters. <laughs> y'all, y'all, it, if we have affection for someone, there ought be, Miss Barbara, an arrangement attached to the affection. I need, to, I, need to, I need to explain that. If I have love for you, there ought be some proof of my love for you. Um, I, I, I think there's going to be a whole lot of transformation today. Um, if y'all receive this message in the spirit, the Lord is having me preach it. See, let me tell you what he's doing. Women did not work during this time. The only way they would have an opportunity to live as if they had children, male children, or if they were married. Jesus is in essence making sure that his mama is going to be provided for. So he looks over at another man and says, I need you to treat her like your mama. Can I tell you what it was? Life insurance. Don't tell me you love me and then you die and you ain't leave me nothing to bury you with. I don't have love in the room, but that's all right. Come on, don't, don't say you love somebody. And then, you know, Gerald mentioned this when he gave his prayer. We ought be leaving the next generation with something behind. We ought be able to have something left over for the next generation that we can hand to them and say, this is yours. One of the struggles with us as people of color is that every generation has to start over from square one. I should not have to be worrying how to pay for your funeral in six days when you couldn't figure out how to pay for your funeral in 66 years. Tend to the needs of your family. That that means if I'm going to have a baby, find a way to make sure they can go to college. Oh, it's quiet in here. Y'all can shout about life insurance, but not about college education. Jesus understood, as every man in this room should understand, that family needs to be a priority. I want you, and that means I don't have an excuse because I worked overtime. Well, I would get there, but I had to work overtime. I would be there for you, but I had something else going on. Can I remind you of the condition he is in? Pain tearing down his, ela- his lacerated back. His body scraping up and down rough wood. Crushing pain of his heart in his chest as his pericardium is filling up with serum and water to the point that he can barely breathe. And while he is on the fringes of death, I'm gonna take care of my family. Yo, that means you all yeah, I'm meddling right now because I'm your pastor and I love you. That that means you're 80-year-old mama, your 90-year-old daddy shouldn't be wondering when you're going to come visit again to the nursing home. It means I ought to do everything I can do while I have them. Father's Day go a whole lot better on the Father's Day that you no longer have your daddy, when when you had your daddy, you did everything you could to love them and support them and encourage them. Whole bunch of y'all crying cause daddy ain't here. When daddy was here, you ain't talk to him. When daddy was here, you didn't encourage him. 
I got a lessons from a model man. Talk to God. Treat people in a way that gives them life. Tend to the needs of your family. He says in Mark chapter 15, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so hard, so far from helping me? He quotes Psalm 22. He teaches us the fourth pivotal lesson. That means I have to learn to treat sin seriously. Jesus is bearing all of the pain and sin of the world on his shoulders. As a result of that, for the first time, he's got detachment and separation from his heavenly father. And he says in the moment of taking on all of our sins, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Can I help somebody for a moment? Y'all, if we would learn to start taking our sin seriously, that that means I ought not, you know, we, we're at a point in society now where we have nicknames for sin. You know, married man cheating, he fooling around. No, that Negro is committing adultery. He ain't fooling around. Oh. Y'all don't want me talking strong in here, I guess. Y'all, we, we, we got to start taking stuff seriously. And, and, and because I want to encourage somebody, whatever your sin is, and we all have come to church with them, this, that's the worst thing in the world to have sin. The worst thing in the world is to ignore the fact that I have sin and not bring my sin to Jesus and to ask him to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I want to encourage everyone in church. God is a forgiving God and God will give you another chance if you just surrender whatever you have done to and be willing to receive his forgiveness. Take it seriously. Take it seriously. Whatever my sin is today, whatever my struggle is today, be willing to bring it to the Father. Then Jesus, I'm, I'm going to close here because I don't have time to preach them all. But I feel like the Lord's going to want me to linger here for just a moment. Then Jesus, after done all that for everybody else, in John 19, he says to Shonda, I thirst. I want to leave, I'm, I'm leaving you here this is as far as I'm going to go because I want to minister this for a moment. But the fifth life lesson he teaches us beyond talking to God, beyond treating people in a way that gives them life, beyond tending to the needs of my family, beyond treating sin seriously, y'all going to shout on this one. I need to learn to take time for myself. I want to go ahead and minister this for a moment. Because we are not good to other people if we are not taking care of ourselves. I want to encourage men because I feel like there's a, there's a the heaviness and a weight. Ladies, I appreciate y'all, but I got to preach to men right now. It's hard being a man. And I'm going to go ahead and say it. It's hard being a black man. I wish uh, y'all don't have, I don't have people being honest. It, it is hard. We got to go through everything everybody else got to go through. And we got to do it in a darker skin. Bruh, take care of yourself. I was meeting with some UNC urologists and oncologists this week. And we're talking about can prostate cancer and how we can do a better job regionally to make sure more men are being tested. Doctor said to me, he said, Pastor, he said, I didn't know how to respond to the man when he made the comment to me that he didn't want to get his prostate checked. He was fine with the blood level, but he didn't want a digit a finger placed up his behind. And I didn't know how to respond to him. I said to the doctor, I said, I can help you with that. 
I said, was he married? He said, yeah. So he had children? He said, yeah. I said, would you rather, so say this to him. Would you rather have a finger placed up your rectum to make sure you can live, or would you, have an, would you rather have another man sleeping with your wife? Or would you rather have another man raising your child? Because if you, if you die early, she going to get married again. And if you die early, somebody else going to raise your children. And what I'm trying to get us to see is that we've got to be willing to take care of ourselves. Because if we take care of ourselves, we have the health necessary to take care of our families. Tell two people, take care of yourself. I, Jesus says, I thirst. Jesus was saying, there's something going on physically with me that I've got to address. There's something going on physically with me that I've got to see what's going on. I've got to address what's going on in my body. I want to encourage us as men, bro, take care of yourself. It, I can't just eat any old thing. I got to shed some pounds. I don't have any amens, but that's all right. I got to drink more water. I need to go for a walk. I need to address the stuff that's giving me anxiety. I feel the Holy Ghost pushing on me. That means I have to know what my trigger points are as a man and anything, watch this, or anyone that's causing my blood pressure to go up and it's causing anxiety and causing depression, I've got to be willing to wipe some slates clean and say, I love me. It's not that I don't love you, but I love me too much to let you take me out of here. Can I encourage somebody to sweep the house clean that you ain't got to hold on to everybody and everything but if folk are weighing you down or pulling you back it is all right to kick them to the curb and keep it moving because at the end of the day you need to live I don't owe everybody a response you don't owe everybody a response to the text message you ain't got to comment on everything. Make up in your mind that I thirst. I care about me. I got some body issues. I got to get my heart right. I got to get my mind right. I got to get me right so I can live. <sighs> it's 1028. I'm going to take two minutes. I'm going to get these quick. Talk to God. Treat people in a way that gives them life. Tend to the needs of your family. Treat sin seriously. Take time for yourself. Transform the world with your work. <sighs> Jesus, just before he dies, says it is finished. He literally says, I'm leaving a body of work behind. And I want to go ahead and minister this. Because our world would be better when men step up to the plate and recognize that they have a God-given anointing, a God-given assignment, a God-given calling. But what we don't need in society is people talking a big game but not having anything to show for what they're talking. God is looking for people with a body of work to transform our world. I, I, I got to say it. I got to say it. I got to say it. Bruh, we supposed to work. I don't, I don't have... Not, 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 not sit home and play video games while she work. Now, I don't, I, this is the kind of preaching that gets me in trouble culturally. But it's been too much flip-flopping of roles and how God has established some stuff. We keep acting like God didn't say what God said and God didn't do what God said do. And you may not like the way God operates, but when you become God, you can change how God operates. Until then, God is God and God is on the throne and God has established how some stuff is supposed to go. 
and I'm not missing my Bible, that when Adam finally got a woman, he had a job first. I'm going to go ahead and preach it. I ain't scared, y'all. I'm not scared of y'all one bit. I don't care how much smooth talking he doing, how good looking he is, how built up he is. If that brother don't have a J-O-B, you need to wait until he is working because at the end of the day, it's a minimum requirement. I'm, 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 I can say so much about this. Talk to God, treat people in a way that gives them life, tend to the needs of your family, treat sin seriously, take time for yourself, transform the world with your work, and I'm closing. Trust God with what matters most. Jesus gives up his life. It wasn't taken from him. He freely gave it. And as he freely gives it, he says into your hands, I commend my spirit. In just a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to get saved. I want somebody to hear me and hear me well and hear me good. At the end of the day, what matters most is surrendering our life to the lordship of Jesus Christ. That at the end of the day, I need to say, Father, into your hands, I'm committing my life. Into your hands, I'm committing my spirit. It's great that you have degrees. It's great that we have jobs. It's great that we drive the nice cars we do. But when push comes to shove, we're going to leave all of that stuff behind. And at the end of the day, it's not just old school church. It's real talk. Only what you do for Christ is going to last. And at the end of the day, what's going to matter is not that I went to Morehouse. When I get the glory, I'm not going to be chanting the Morehouse school song. I'm not going to be wearing any special Morehouse colors. I'm not going to be wearing any special frat or sorority colors. I'm not going to have my, my level as a mason. I'm not going to have none of that. All I'm going to have is a relationship with the Lord Jesus. Either I know him or I don't. And I'm trying to get somebody to see all of the ground. I said all of the ground is sinking sand. You got to decide to make Jesus your choice. Some folk would rather have houses and land. Some folk choose silver and gold. These things they treasure and forget about their soul. But I decided to make Jesus my choice. You got to have a relationship with him. Everything else is fleeting. Everything else is sand. Everything else is going away from here. It's not going to be a place in heaven. I wish it were. But there won't be no HBCU side, PWI side. There won't be a Church of God in Christ side and a Baptist side. There won't be a GED PhD side. There won't be, there won't be a mansion mobile home side. There won't be a bicycle rider, walker, Mercedes driving side. It's going to be Jesus and Jesus alone. Which is why this is the most important moment in your life. This moment, everything else is sinking sand. A model man commits what matters most to God. You matter so much, I'm preaching to men and women. You matter so much to God, he wants you to put your life in his hands. He wants you to put your marriage in his hands. He wants you to put your children in his hands. He wants you to put your finances in his hands. He wants you to put your health in his hands. God's hands are big enough to handle everything in your life. God, take it all. Anybody here with a testimony, everything that I put in God's hands turned out better than it was before? You've heard it said, but it's worthy of me repeating it now. Everything changes based upon the hands it's put in. A basketball in my hands is worth nothing. A basketball in Michael Jordan's hands 
is worth millions. Baseball bat in my hand is worth a strikeout. A baseball bat in A-Rod's hand is worth the World Series. It all depends whose hand. Golf club in my hand don't mean nothing. Swinging and hitting air. But a golf club in a professional golfer's hand is worth hundreds of millions. Your life, my life, in my hand is a mess. But my life in God's hands is peace. It is power. It is potential. It is prosperity. It is a hope. It is a future. It is exceedingly. It is abundantly. It is above. It is beyond all that we could ask, hope, think, or imagine. It all depends on whose hands it's in.